My name is Simon Marginson. I'm the director of this uh, Centre for Global Higher Education. Uh, and um, I'd like to welcome you all to this first conference in person since yeah. 2019. Wonderful to see you all here. Uh, and wonderful to have the chance to have this kind of level of exchange, uh, this kind of communication. Um, the conference is an opportunity to share notes about higher education, where it's going, what's happening, to see the CG projects in action and to engage on the major issues of the time, uh, beginning with our first session, which will take us from higher to tertiary. This is the first of two days of our annual conference. The second day is an online day, as you probably realise, and we really welcome you all again to, for participation in the online conference which will feature another round of keynotes and panels. Um, the the uh, uh, housekeeping, I think I will take on, Chris, or leave you with the interesting part of the opening of the session. Um, now, first, the Wi-Fi setup. Um, conference attendees can use EduRAM if they have it, or they can sign on to the internet via UCL guests. I don't know whether you've ever been down that road. It's an interesting road. It takes you to a sky sign-in page it's a hassle, but it's free. And you've got a little time in the opening session to get it sorted. Um, at the end of the conference, um, we'll um, recycle the badges that you've been given. So um, look out for the postgrads who will be collecting those with collection boxes at the end of the day uh, by the door to Geoffrey Hall. So do return your, do return your badge. Um, now, fire safety. This is really why I'm here. Uh, if you discover a fire, um, raise the alarm by breaking the glass at the nearest call point. Um, when activated, the alarm system will sound continuously and the building must be evacuated immediately. The assembly point is in Woburn Square. Do not use the building lifts. Use all emergency exits, not just the main exit. Go straight to the building assembly point and do not assemble immediately outside the building as this may obstruct others evacuating the building. Do not re-enter the building until instructed to do so by the fire brigade or a responsible staff member. You can interpret that as you wish. Um, the toilets are located outside of Jeffrey Hall in Crush Hall and they're to the left of Logan Hall. That's outside of Jeffrey Hall in Crush Hall to the left of Logan Hall. Smoking is prohibited in the building and in any outdoor areas of the UCL estate. That you can also interpret as you wish. Um, if you need to smoke, you may leave UCL property. Um, now, it's a pleasure to hand over to the bona fide chair of this session, Chris Mil Professor Chris Milward, um, who is Professor of Practice in Education Policy at the University of Birmingham. Many of you will know of his work at the, at the Office for Students on Widening Participation. He's um, also uh, Chair of the CG Advisory Board. Chris. OK. Uh, well, thanks, thanks, Simon. I think the one thing you didn't say, and as far as I'm aware, none of the session has been produced by chat GPT this morning, which seems to be an experience that most of the conferences I've been to over the last three months. Um, so the opening session, I'm, I'm such privileged to, to chair this, is on from higher to tertiary in post-school education, national and international perspectives. Um, I think this is a great start to the conference because it captures four characteristics that are quite distinctive to the Centre for Global Higher Education. And they are first a global and system level perspective on higher education, enabling comparison of systems, sharing of approaches across different countries and indeed continents. Um, second, the application of that and the contextualisation of that for the very particular situation here in the UK um, where the centre is based and of course it's funded by UK agencies. And the UK is, a, is an interesting place to look at higher education. On the one hand we have a UK global identity for higher education, we fund research at the UK level and there's a huge amount of mobility and of staff and students between the countries, but equally there are devolved powers, particularly around education, which means a quite different positioning of universities in relation to other parts of the education system, 
in relation to the market and in relation to the state. So we do have quite different approaches to financing and regulating higher education across the four countries of the UK. Um, the third element that is characteristic, I think, is a growing interest in the relationship between and indeed integration of technical and vocational education and higher education. Um, that seems clear to be a concern worldwide, um, as there's increasing higher education participation, there's greater scrutiny of the cost of it, the returns from it, and the consequences of the growth of higher education for, for example, spatial inequality um, and other forms of inequality. Um, in, in England, we seem to be continually having a debate about the financing of universities, and that's all over the press just over the last week. But actually, in government, there's a very live discussion about tertiary systems, tertiary oversight. You have that advancing in Scotland and in Wales, potentially also in Ireland, which Ellen may talk about. Um, in England, we've had the Auger Review, which was really the first review in England really to look seriously at the whole of post-school education in the round, as well as a new lifelong loan entitlement, which will operate across further and higher education. So a new spirit of thinking around tertiary education, which I think can only increase into the future. Um, the fourth element that's characteristic of CGHE is a commitment to bridging between academia and government, between research and policy. And this morning's session is a terrific example of that because we have two speakers who are highly distinctive in the extent to which they've operated and worked across those two spheres. So the first speaker is Alison Wolf. Alison is not only Professor of Public Sector Management at King's College London, she served on the Auger Review, which I mentioned, and the 2016 Independent Panel on Technical Education. She sits in the House of Lords and has just completed a spell as the Prime Minister's advisor on skills and the workforce in number 10 Downing Street. Uh, once Alison has spoken, we'll hand over to Ellen Hazelcorn. Ellen is Professor Emeritus at Technical, uh, uh, Technological University Dun Dublin, Joint Editor of, Editor of Policy Reviews in Higher Education, and she is a central contributor to the, to the work and the governance of CGHE. Uh, she's also an advisor to many governments across Europe, and crucially for the discussion this morning, she wrote the Hazelcorn Review, which influenced some of those tertiary developments in Wales. Um, so that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Alison if you're able to come and give us your session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had intended to be up here, but the clicker isn't working. And since the camera is there, I've been told I need to stand here and stare at the camera. So, um, so um, apologies in advance. No, I, they, they've tried two, Claire, and they aren't working. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we just have to live with it, and I apologise deeply to everybody on that side. Um, you'll just have, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do about it, to be honest, short of it. jumping think, up and down. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully at the end there'll be time for a few, a few yeah. questions, so we will, you will then actually get to see my face as opposed to just hear my voice. So it's a huge pleasure to be here, and to start the thing off, I thought with a bit of a global overview, because... Um, Yes, indeed, we have a conference which is about tertiary. When we wrote the Auger Review, we were very conscious that we were thinking about things in tertiary terms. But I suppose the, 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 the question that we probably should contemplate is whether a larger growing tertiary system is in fact going to be a larger, rather different, higher education system, or whether there are indeed a variety of routes that one can go and what the global scene has to tell us. So I want to start by just putting up a graph showing some numbers which I think are probably quite familiar to many people here. The extraordinary thing about the 20th century, <coughs> and it's continued into the 21st, is the, the sudden dramatic increase in university places, and I want to underline university places. It chugs along at a very low level, really until post-war. I mean, the, the, the US is slightly different, but that's actually slightly fake, because it's higher, be largely because teacher training was in universities earlier than anywhere else, um, as were a number of other things. And so, basically, they did what everybody else has now done earlier. But, but leaving that aside, 
the, the growth in university enrollments has been staggering, absolutely staggering. And when you look at not only the number of people who enroll, that, that, that um, graph that I just gave you there, but actually at completion rates in the OECD, you realize that compared to Actually, when I was a child, I mean, this is not, you know, which is a fair time ago, but, but not even <laughs> in historic times, an enormously long time ago. The, the completion rates, the number, the proportion of people aged 25 to 34 who have completed some form of tertiary education is, again, extraordinarily high. I mean, it's now in Korea, it's up to 70%. The OECD average is 45, UK over the 52, and although some of those are what will be termed short cycle, so what in this country would be, say, a foundation degree, an HND, a very, very, very high proportion of that is straight university enrollments for degrees, either, you know, either full bachelor's degrees or, as I said, in some cases, sort of you know, associates, but, 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 you know, and this is the developed world, but the, 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 the growth has been actually even more extraordinary in the developing world. And this, I think, is in a sense, you can call it a triumph or a problem. But what we have seen is country after country committing to university opportunities for its population. And enrollment rates which in developing countries are far higher for a given level of national income, a given level of development than they were in the current developed world. So just again to give you, these are slightly random except for Cameroon, I'll come to Cameroon in a minute. Um, if, if you just take almost randomly a university in West Africa, so Nigeria, the first university college in Nigeria was 1948. I mean, there were a lot of people alive in the world who were alive in 1948. Um, and you look today, this is a country with a large network of universities, and universities which are as big as those that we are familiar with in London. You know, these are down Lagos. This is, the, this is UCL, KCL type territory. These are huge institutions. Ghana, the same. Cameroon, um, I happen to know quite well, a uh, formidable lady who was the rector of, the, the, of the, the two I've picked out there in turn. And what is extraordinary about her is that in 1953, Cameroon had no secondary schools. Um, she and her sister went to Nigeria. They were the first cohort of, of, of girls who got any secondary education in Cameroon. Um, and they had to get their secondary education elsewhere. And she's still fully fledged working. You know, this is not somebody in there. And today, this is a country with, a, with six internationally ranked and recognized universities, which are sizable. So this is a level of growth which reminds one of, actually reminds one of the Industrial Revolution. This is the sort of story you would have told about Manchester. So that's the first thing that I want to highlight in terms of you know, a, a global tertiary system. It's marked most dramatically by an enormous rise in the number of universities and university students. The second thing which is more recent is that it has become a global industry in a different sense. It's not just an industry that everybody has, it's a global industry. In fact, for this country, it's one of our biggest export industries. And the, again, this is actually more uneven, but, but very important in terms of understanding, again, the pressures on the global system. Because although only a limited number of countries are global recruiters on a large scale, the whole world is aware of this, and every ambitious parent in the world is aware of the fact that not all universities are equal and that there are good reasons to try and send your child to something that is actually globally recognized. So in the UK, we now have over 600,000 overseas students. Um, and what is extraordinary is that that is almost a quarter of enrollment. Australia is over a quarter, even after the ups and downs of the last couple of years. Um, not only in higher education, but also in VET. We have far fewer in, in, in our colleges than Australia or Canada do. 
The USA has huge numbers, but it's completely different in its impact. The difference between having, you know, a fifth, a quarter of your students come from outside the country and having 5% is, is obviously enormous. Um, if you are, an, if you are um, running an American university, you look at those figures and you go, plenty of prospects for growth there. Um, if, <laughs> Um, Canada, even more rapid, again, very, very rapid growth, up to 16%, um, opened the doors of the colleges very much, um, definitely in the college sector, even more than in the university sector. Overseas students are critical to every college's finances, and if you talk to a I actually think the Canadian colleges are great. I don't know if there are any Canadians here. But if you talk to um, the, the head or the finance officer of any college, which is like our FE colleges, but without 16 to 18-year-olds, um, overseas students are absolutely critical to the funding. And of course, this is very uneven. And this, again, is about, you know, is everybody going the same way, or are there real differences in the pattern that can emerge? Well, what you find in um, what I'll call recruiting countries is obviously, again, or perhaps not obviously, but what you do find is you find big differences between institutions. So, you know, we're sitting in UCL. UCL is right up there. I think, L I think LSE pips UCL the post, but... Um, you're a bit ahead of us, but not much, <laughs> I think. 40, 48%, so that's less than half, are home domiciled. Liverpool, 76%, 24% international. Gloucestershire, 93%, 86% English, because they get quite a lot from Wales, as do Liverpool. Um, Edinburgh, I think, is one of the most interesting. 56% home domiciled, but only 27% Scottish domiciled because Scottish students don't bring in the cash that English students bring in. And if you are Edinburgh and you want to remain a top global university, that really matters. So what you've got there is a, a global system which is generating differences between countries in how many overseas students they recruit, and also in recruiting countries, some major differences within the system. So what is my conclusion about this and about trying to predict the future, which is always a mug's game, but, you know, hey, let's go for it. Um, well, I'm afraid it's follow the money. If you want to know what's going to happen to, the, to our systems, to global systems, to, to whether tertiary systems end up much the same or very distinct, um, a huge amount of it has to do with funding. I mean, just a terrifying amount has to do with funding. Who pays for university education and how? And how do students fund their studies? And I have to say, after spending quite a lot of time in the last decade in and out of government, the thing that really strikes me probably not when you're inside the office of students, but when you're actually inside the, the spending departments or anywhere near the treasury, is that a very large proportion of your time or a very large proportion of government time is spent on financial questions. And that is not particular to this country. That is that it, so so the, the funding pressures and the funding fights, I'm not going to argue that they're completely unaffected by issues of principle and policy. But on a regular basis, every year, every three years, fights over money which are actually taking place within the budget lead to decisions which have enormous implications for the development of, 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 of both universities and the rest of tertiary education, and for which students can go where and on what terms. So just to kind of um, you know, reiterate that, almost all university systems in the modern world are essentially public. We tend to think America is different because there are the, the, the because there's a sizable private sector, what they refer to as the privates, which always makes anybody from Britain laugh. But um, so 
there are prestigious private, uh, very important prestigious private universities, and there are prestigious private universities elsewhere. I mean, you know, Italy now has Bocconi. Some of the Conde Col in France are definitely private, not public institutions. But basically, university systems globally are public. And you know, going back to the United States, the vast majority of students are in public institutions. Um, and prestigious private universities tend to be charities and not for profit. And for a while, there was the idea that there were two things that were going to open up the sector and change it and create a more efficient sector, one that might actually be more affordable, one that would actually provide access. And the two things that people believed in, and I, some people still believe in one of them, um, were that the answers lay in a combination of, or one of, opening the sector up to for-profit competition on the grounds that they would not waste money the way we guys do. Um, and secondly, that online education was the, was the wave of the future, which would completely transform the way that we did education. And from the point of view of politicians, it would be more efficient. It would be cheaper. We will finally get a productivity breakthrough. Well, um, I have to say the history of online for profit in the United States does not encourage this conclusion. Um, I don't know how many people here know or remember the University of Phoenix in its heyday? The University of Phoenix is an online university, um, but it has gone from 470,000 students down to 85,000. It's just been bought in a distress sale by the University of Idaho after um, Arkansas jibbed at the last minute. Um, it was a distress sale. It follows the University of Arizona buying um, Ashford, another online for profit for a dollar, and Purdue bought Kaplan. And in each case, they converted them into not-for-profits. And this followed regulatory activity by by the, 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 the federal government to some extent. But also I think that um, it didn't, they, in the end, they didn't deliver on the promise. Um, it turned out that it's hard to study online, that the um, certification is not treated the same way by gatekeepers. And generally, if you look at the users of online education, what you discover is that um, they tend to be there's more online through community colleges in America, for example, and the people who are doing it will not be the people who are, who, whose parents are very clear that they are aspiring to Wesleyan, Brown, Harvard. Um, the, 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 the top universities do not, on the whole, go online. But on top of that, as I said, if a sector is run and funded by the state, and this is why I think people some people, um, not only on the right, were attracted by this idea of a sector that was sort of self-funding and, 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 and free. A sector that is funded by the state, which effectively means the overwhelming majority of tertiary institutions across the globe, are caught up in the fiscal struggles that, 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 that dominate modern government. And will go on dominating modern government. Because what I've shown here is Government spending as a percentage of GDP. There are a couple of bits that go, go, go down to the bottom because there's no data, by the way. This is just, this is, these are IMF figures. And the ones that go right up are wartime. Essentially, what you can see there is you can see that going from very low, this is 1900, in 1900, developed countries like France, Italy, Spain, the UK were spending about 10% of GDP through the government. We're now all up, somewhere around, hovering under or just over the 50% mark. This is a huge difference. And you know, in terms of the, the annual budgetary fights, what really dominates government discussion, whether it's president in France or the cabinet in this country or indeed office of budget management in, in, the, U, in the US, is that... What that represents is an ongoing growth in commitments. And, you know, it's, just as an aside, the U.S. is not really any different. It's just that it does its health care differently. So when the figures, when you do the figures, it looks as if they're spending less. But actually, honestly, if anything, from the point of view of an individual, the tax burden, if you add in your health insurance payments, is at least as great. 
So this is a representation of something which is, I think, really important to understand. And these are commitments which it's very hard to reverse. So first we committed to primary schooling for all, up to age 10, 11, 12. My grandparents left at 13. Then the state starts to get involved in apprenticeship support, or some states do. This has been a, a more uneven pattern, which I'll, I'll come back to. But the key Swiss legislation and the key German legislation were both 19th century. So that was the state getting involved in something that had just been, in, been businesses. The next thing was secondary schooling for all. Secondary schooling for all became a general commitment across the world. Um, again, in many countries, you do still have to pay for some of it, but inexorably, as the economy grows, state secondary education becomes universal and it becomes free. Next, you move to university education for all academic track secondary pupils. And effectively, what you see is a move from, not, not yet in Scotland, but there are always the colleges. But what, again, the inexorable move is from tightly capped numbers who can go to university, having done an academic edu secondary education, to a commitment which basically or legally says, if you complete that, you have a right to go. So in Germany and in France, for example, if you have the abitur, if you have the back, you have a legal right to go to university. Um, in this country, we move to a de facto situation where, you know, if the university will take you, it's fine. Same in, in, in America, de facto, you need a high school, a high school diploma, but that's now 86% of the population. So generally, academic track definition becomes wider and wider, and you move completely inexorably towards commitment to that. Next commitment is preschool for all. At first, it's just the kindergarten. Um, then it's tertiary education for all. You, there, there should be free sub-degree, these can come at different speeds, but again, um, when we did the Augur Review, one of the things that we said was it was absolutely appalling, as had the House of Lords Committee, on which I was not sitting, that there was no free level three for those who didn't, com didn't complete it at, 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 at school. That's now been introduced. There is now free level three whenever you want it once. Um, it costs money. It does cost money. And now we have moved to nursery and childcare. And that's not something we reverse. Again, this has been slow and there's been resistance. And there's been resistance because it costs money. And there's all the other stuff there. So you've now got this huge set of commitments to education spending. And if you look at government spending, you'll see that the big, big consumption departments are health, which is a whole discussion on its own, obviously, which is the, the blue one, um, education. Defense has shrunk to being tiny. Public order is 5%. Um, transport is also, I think, um, it's not very big. I'm trying to see which one it is, 3%, I think. And most of the other stuff is benefits. It's pensions, it's unemployment insurance, it's, it's universal credit, it's in the US, it would be everything that's covered by Social Security. So basically, you've got enormous pressure on this system. Education is one of the big spenders. Health is always fighting for it. Basic rule of thumb, health always wins. Health always wins. Education does sometimes get cut, Health never gets cut. But as you can see, this means that any tertiary system in the modern world is from the point of view of government, first of all, it's its problem. And secondly, there is never enough money. And there are always new commitments. Um, and so it goes. So inside government, discussions of tertiary education are, with universities at the tertiary level, by far the biggest item. And the item which the more people are going to university, the more you feel that you can't do anything too harsh to them because an awful lot of your voters are involved. So within a university sector, or within education, for example, schools always beat vocational because schools are bigger. MPs have lots of head teachers hammering on their doors and only one FE principal. Uh, within tertiary, universities are more of a concern, not just because they're big earners in some countries, but because the more people are going to university, the more of your voters have a stake in universities, 
more than do in other parts of the tertiary system. And you basically have, you don't have many choices. You can, make, you can spend less and less per student, which is what many countries have done, and that's very popular. And then you can say university education is free. Um, it never is free. It will come to this maintenance, of course. But, but university ed education is free at the point of use, like, like healthcare. And that's hugely popular. But there's hardly a country in the world that has managed to maintain that commitment and still maintain anything approaching the level of spending that was being made even 30 years ago. So that's your first choice. And your second choice is to introduce fees in various different ways, and Nick Barr is here and can talk about this for, for, forever, and we have what I still think, thank you, Nick, is the best approach to this with income contingent loans. But the reality is that fees, although people have now in this country become, I think, quite used to the idea that it's not unreasonable for students to pay for some of it. Politically, it's not popular. And when they tried to introduce fees in Germany, there were huge student demonstrations. And, and they, they, the governments, they, the Lander governments backtracked. But low funding threatens quality. And university education is a clear example of what's known as the cost disease, which means that you don't get, you, the country gets richer, so you have to pay people more. But it's a sector where people aren't more productive, which was why people were so optimistic about online, to a lesser degree, bringing in the private sector. So you've got, you've got this, these strains, and they're pushing you in certain directions. They're pushing you towards prioritizing higher education. They're pushing you towards either reducing quality at speed or insisting that people pay. And, you know, it's very hard. Just some snapshots from 2023. In Scotland, um, real teaching funding has declined by 27% since 2015, and they've just cut it in cash. They've actually just announced a cash cut in Scotland. Uh, they've, cut, they've cut college spending even more, by the way. Um, just about every state system in the United States is having a big budget battle in spite of you know, federal largesse on various things because the, the COVID funding has, has stopped. And, and that's even the flagship places. So Rutgers got a 125 million deficit this year. And um, Connecticut, you know, it's hardly, Connecticut is hardly a kind of, you know, red state um, Trump stronghold or anything, but, you know, again, huge cuts. And it's very hard, even with income contingent loans, politically, to keep the level of the fee up. So here we've had this, this ongoing cut in New Zealand. Um, they have again, big political arguments. Um, Labour government a few years ago proclaimed it was going to go back to free, free fees. They haven't. They've introduced one for a year. But, but funding for non-university tertiary tends to fare considerably worse. And the other thing which I think it's also worth bearing in mind is that maintenance costs are actually at least as important for students, if not more so. They don't get discussed inside government in most cases because in most countries, nothing very much is done about them. And, if, and that's not something that's yet been added to that tick list. Um, and so a lot of countries have very low fees or no fees, but very, very little maintenance. We have maintenance loans, um, but... At the moment, their, their generosity has shrunk, rather. So, again, these are the, these, the other thing is that maintenance for non-university students is almost universally absent altogether. So, again, these are things that are pushing, pushing people in the sources. Of, so, quickly, are we all going to end up with everybody going to university, tiny little rump vocational sector, um, and will all these university sectors be the same? Well, I think there are things that, 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 that counteract what can feel like a, 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 a one-way street. The first is the degree of hierarchy in your system. Um, there will be hierarchy. There, there just will be. I, I think that, you know, I'm prepared to argue that you, you cannot imagine a society where the vast majority of people go into tertiary education without some sort of hierarchy. Um, and if you try to suppress it centrally, it will pop up, if only by sending your kids overseas or whatever. But there are differences in the degree of hierarchy, and there are differences in the extent to which all tertiary institutions are the same sort of university. 
And there are also relative differences in whether all universities are treated the same. So big difference there. Um, there are, there, there, there can be, and my own faint hope is that there will be, growing differentiation in the, the pattern of tertiary study, which I'll come back to in a second. I'll try and speed up. Um, there are differences in how centrally controlled your systems are. I'm not going to talk about that much. And I would say critically there are differences in the quality and importance of the apprenticeship route. And those are sources of divergence, which within these broad global sweeps, I think, are very important not least to, on the one hand, quality, and on the other hand, equality of access and opportunity. So there are, what, what we have is we have global winners, global systems and global institutions. But the extent to which you've got a hierarchy internally in a country's university depends on the patterns of funding and the way research funding goes. It depends on pre-expansion resources. It depends on levels of autonomy. And it depends critically, and it's very hard to create this after the fact, on the existence of non-university tertiary institutions which governments preserve. And there are major differences, and if governments are committed to preserving those, I think it's hard to create them, you, um, which enroll a significant proportion of students, then you do have a very different system from one in which everybody just feels they have to go to the same huge university. Um, if you reject hierarchy and you work very hard to make all your universities equal, it's quite, it's almost impossible to have world leaders and it's quite hard to have world leaders because it's quite hard to maintain really good research universities. That's a whole debate which I'm sure everybody here has had. The other thing I would say is if there were no established prestigious non-university institutions before the great expansion began, it's hard to create them after the event. Um, you don't have to make all your institutions universities. If you don't, and there, there, and there aren't high status ones that already existed, you will end up with a clear hierarchy. So take, for example, one of my favorite systems, as you'll have gathered, which is the Canadian. I think that you know, Canada has universities, it has colleges. The colleges are very good. They are not the same thing. It is not the same thing to go to, the, to Queen's or the University of Toronto or McGill as it is to go to your local college. It just isn't. Um, and reputation is sticky and it's self-perpetuating. So there's a combination there of possible sources of divergence and, and things that, that are the same. The other thing which I do think we still do have the potential to change and therefore to diverge over is whether we have a rigid or a flexible model. And traditionally, Tertiary routes were full-time routes for the young, and that was true whether they were university, technical institution, or apprenticeship. They were the route into the labor market when you were young. To an extraordinary degree, that is still true. The only country that bucks this really to a significant degree is the United States. And again, I'm not saying that you are likely to come out if you do that in the same place as if you come out from Harvard or Yale, but nonetheless, it is a more realistic opportunity in America than elsewhere. And the lifelong loan entitlement, which will become live in, well, it's live in 25, which means it's sort of going to go live next year, um, is intended to try and break that pattern to some extent in this country and open up opportunities. But I want to finish with apprenticeship because although it's not really what we're focusing on today, um, when we think tertiary, I think we tend to think in terms of tertiary teaching on institutions. But I actually have come to the conclusion that um, it is the, the, the one alternative route which can maintain and even increase status alongside the route that the whole world is traveling down, which is funneling all its 18-year-olds into, into lecture halls. Um, it's very difficult. It's, it's, seen, it's seen generally as kind of, you know, you do an apprenticeship if you're an electrician or a bricklayer or something. But actually, of course, all the professions used to do it too. You, you, were, you, were, you were articled. You were, and, and medicine was also effectively a, uh, an apprenticeship profession and only actually came into the universities from the medical schools which were attached to the hospitals quite recently. Um, it works well to the degree it's controlled by employers and 
that's financially supported by the state. It's very difficult to support, to, de to develop from scratch. It's quite easy to undermine. Um, I, th I feel increasingly that it really matters whether we preserve, build on, and nurture this, because my own rather pessimistic conclusion is that otherwise we have this, this, this global drift towards something which is going to be very difficult, bluntly, to finance at a satisfactory level. But people are very, you know, um, there's a lot of schizophrenia about it. I mean, our, our current education ministers say that they believe passionately in apprenticeships, but they only really seem to like them when they lead to degrees, which seems to me to be deeply <laughs> schizophrenic. Anyway. <laughs> So next, um, I, I think it's um, I, I think it's it's really you know it's it's it is up for grabs. I've said everybody is going in this direction. Um, governments are increasingly worried about low returns to unit to um, university education. This is also actually. Um, the, numerically illiterate, innumerate. I mean, if you send everybody to, to high tertiary education, they can't all earn over an average. Um, it's, but but they, are all, they are all very concerned about it. This may have a knock-on. I think that the, 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 the pressure to maintain access for all your voters and their children will win out. Um, citizens are often quite negative about university now, but people keep coming. Participation rates are not falling. Um, and as I said, whether you have the piece of paper and where you got it from is not showing any sign of becoming less important in people's life chances. So I think, in f to, to finish, it's not inevitable that everybody goes down the same route, but I think that the risk is that we will end up with a, a global system in which, the, in which the particular nature of your national system interacts with where you are globally, and that... The, the downside risk is that we will end up, because of the financial pressures and the political pressures, with vast numbers of people going into lecture halls at 18. I think that there are ways we can change it. I think countries that have good technical institutes must preserve them. I think those of us who have apprenticeship systems must preserve them. And I do think that the one area that we can make progress on is flexibility of access. So that's my hurtle around the globe. Um, I think I beat Puck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Many thanks, Alison. So um, a lot of questions flowing from that. But before we get into that, I'm going to ask Ellen to deliver her contribution. Then we should have about half an hour for Q&A after that. Oh, do you want that? I don't want this. Can you do a quick transfer? It's on Great. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll start again. And I'll just get a bit of water. Okay, so hi, good morning everyone. And I don't, I'm going to speak from, from notes and the title of, of my talk is, Is it Time to Rethink Our Model of Post-Secondary Education? Um, progressing a Tertiary Education Ecosystem. And I'm going to take a wider perspective um, from what my colleague um, presented and which I agree with a lot of what she had to say. So. In opening up, I want, it's clear that universal or near universal participation in higher education has been a huge achievement for OECD countries, as Alison has indicated. But as we look towards the future, um, globalization, geopolitical shifts, an aging population, the technological and digital revolutions, and strategies for a sustainable green and blue economy will continue to reshape our societies how and where we live and where we work. How will or should these developments impact on our model of higher educational provision, which has remained relatively unchanged 
as if it was still a system catering to a small elite. After all, the top 100 universities, for which a lot of governments have spent a lot of focus of attention, actually recruit less than about 2% of the total students worldwide, and across Europe, about 4%. So attention is increasingly drawn to learners gradually left behind by the current system, the other 50%, or who are, who are left behind by the system or are unable to access the system in any meaningful or sustained way. This is having consequences for social cohesion, political participation, and trust in our institutions. Much more radical thinking is required as to how we structure, govern, fund and deliver post-secondary education. This is driving many countries to reframe the policy discussion and conversation around tertiary education. But beyond the headlines, what do we actually mean by tertiary education? And what do we want to achieve? So today I want to look at some of the factors driving the shift to tertiary education. I also want to consider some of the international responses and what the elements of a tertiary system might be. But first, I want to reflect briefly on the concept of systems and the idea of a tertiary ecosystem. So towards a tertiary ecosystem. As the first country to experience massification, the 1960s prompted a dynamic and far-reaching conversation in the US about growing popular demand for, participation in, access to, and the public mission of higher education. By then, 45% of California's college-age population was already matriculating to higher education compared with a national US average of about 25%. The master plan attributed to Clark Kerr, although he was just one of the authors, was an attempt to design the public system to address the twin issues of massification and diversification and arguably resources funding. As the University of California Regents remarked, the baby boom children, of which I must admit I am one, um, were reaching college age and massive increases in college enrollment um, were projected for the years 1960 to 75. The master plan was born of the tremendous pressures to find a way to educate unprecedented numbers of students. As Simon Martinson explains in his highly recommended 2016 account, The Dream is Over, the California plan com combined the values of public service with a commitment to universal access in a, system a systemic, efficient, and structured manner. It aimed to create and preserve three distinct subsectors, or more accurately, I would say tiers, based on the principle of division of labor, talent, and knowledge production. While providing a route to opportunity, it sought to enforce clear boundaries between elite research intensive universities, mid-ranking teaching and research universities, and open access community colleges with pathways upwards, always upwards between them. The plan anticipated Martin Troll's conceptualization of the transition from elite to mass universal higher education. In the decades since, trial schema has been interpreted and used to explain different phases in the expansion or growth of higher ed and as a model for a system in which diverse institutions operate in tandem. He keenly anticipated the way in which the democratization of higher education would result in access and participation becoming a personal and societal obligation whereby, quote, to f failure to go on to higher education from secondary school is increasingly a mark of some defect of mind or character that has to be explained or justified or apologized for. While the master plan proffered the idea of higher education as more than a collection of individual institutions, trial considered the way in which higher education would come to be defined and changed by problems. I guess I prefer the word challenges of expansion. This would affect not only governance, arrangements, delivery modes, and other matters, but also the interaction between higher education and the state and wider society, a theme taken up by Burton Clark in his work on coordination. By the 1990s, discussion switched to Europe and elsewhere as massification took off in these countries and regions. So three initial um, brief observations. First, what's clear 
and arguably understandable given the circumstances, is a focus was on higher education. The supremacy of knowledge economy and, cap and human capital paradigms alongside formalization of the bachelor, master, doctorate ladder converge to distinguish and boost the significance of the research university sector. The rise of global rankings and the battle for talent reinforced its role as a gateway to the global economy. The post-secondary space not only became defined by higher education, or more precisely by research universities, but universities were effectively affirmed by policymakers and scholars alike as the post-secondary system, and resources have been directed accordingly. Second, as a result, the rest of the post-secondary sector, which caters for most of our learners in highly diverse and specialized institutions, has been effectively airbrushed out of consideration. While Carrick, Carrick acknowledged the role played by community colleges, the California plan was arguably intent on preserving the elite role of the, of the, uni, of the research resource intensive University of California system. Community colleges have been and are rightly praised as being an entry route for widening participation in open access, but sadly they're more likely to be less funded and the students less resourced despite the populations they serve. Third, post-secondary, and not simply higher education, is increasingly and widely recognized as a vital component of our societies and economies' infrastructure. Anthony Carnevale of the Center for Education and Workforce at Georgetown argues that at least two years post-secondary is essential for 21st century society in the labor market. However, the sector has been allowed to evolve or grow in a very ad hoc and haphazard way. Diversity and differentiation are considered key concepts of mass systems, albeit too often they've led to static configuration, configurations with impermeable barriers, reinforcing social stratification according to labor market requirements and simplistic assumptions about knowledge production. It's crude. Um, division between basic and applied, for example, and we'll, one can go on. While the master plan was praised for preserving the separate missions of the three types of public institutions, other countries solved the problem by implementing a strict binary between traditional universities or universities and those that have pejoratively called non-universities. That the systems and boundaries are rigid and system static is often seen as a virtue. But I want to argue that it's been a huge disadvantage. Over time, societies and labor markets have changed. Disciplines have moved up the value chain, leading boundaries to blur. There's been a, system, a seismic shift from simplistic differentiators to a much broader understanding of diversity, public and private, national and international, global and corporate, and the list can go on comprehensive specialists, campus-based virtual, and institutions straddling them. It's clear that the thinking and the models that underpin the first phase of massification are no longer appropriate to meet individual and societal demands and requirements today and into the future. After all, our grandchildren, my grandchildren, um, born today, our students, will live into the next century. Accordingly, I want to suggest that we talk about tertiary ecosystems. The concept of systemness has been credited to Neil Smouser, who described the modern research university as a multi-campus network of interrelated parts and relationships. Nancy Zimfer, with whom I've worked and collaborated for quite a while, operationalized the concept during her tenure as chancellor of SUNY, the State University of New York. In 2013, she wrote, systemness is the ability of a system to coordinate the activities of its constituent campuses so that on the whole, the system behaves in a way that is more powerful and impactful than what can be achieved by individual campuses and acting alone, what I often call capacity beyond individual capability. The concept, however, exposed underlying tensions between flagships the elite end, and the rest of the system, to which Nancy uh, retorted that flagships are not owed some kind of privileged treatment. Despite this exchange and thinking, um, SUNY's higher education system 
3.0 or more recently Ron Barnett's work on ecological approach are still focused on shaping the higher education system. So I want to instead propose that we adopt the, the concept of an ecosystem and in doing so I'm deliberately trying to widen our lens to embrace the entire post-secondary landscape, one in which different types of education, training and research and innovation actors interact with each other in formal, informal and non-formal arrangements which are mutually and socially beneficial and interdependent, open and hidden. The ecosystem is a dynamic space where in the number, type, role and responsibilities of providers individually and collectively evolves and modifies over time in response to changing environment. And while recognizing distinct missions, notably there should be no implicit hierarchy. Five different ideas, sets of ideas widely familiar to you all have influenced my views. One is the work on the civic engaged and the civic and engaged university, which foregrounds the idea of engagement, the co-production of knowledge and public value because complex problems require collaborative solutions. More significantly, collaboration involves not just academics and enterprise, but all educational providers, both higher education and vet, vocational education training, but also schools and civil society, and we often forget schools in this discussion. Second, innovation networks and regional clusters. Research and innovation depends on and derives from interactions across a network of different actors, conducted increasingly through multilateral, interregional, and global networks, because complex problems require collaborative solutions. The substantive message of the SDGs is just that. Thirdly, the geography of place. Being place-based and place-responsive is an approach which starts from understanding the interconnections and relationships between the physical place, rural and urban, and socioeconomic issues. Schools, colleges, and universities are active contributors to placemaking, to innovation, to social and economic development as collaborators and co-producers, but not sole providers of new ideas or outcomes. Fourthly, key for me is always governance, underpinned by strategic vision and meaningful arrangements which ensure sustainable coherence, collaboration and coordination between different actors, each of which has their own internal logics and ambitions. And five, biodiversity. Describes a rich variation of life forms wherein each species plays a critical role mutually supporting each other without whom the entire system may collapse. Four of these ideas clearly were about and are about and derived talking about higher ed. Biodiversity normally refers to the natural life. But they all embody the four C's of what I call coherence, collaboration, coordination, and co-production under which a dynamic tertiary education system needs to exist. So reflecting on this changing context, over the last 50 years or so, as Alison has pointed out, post-secretary education has been arguably democratized. We've seen an incredible um, growth, and as she's pointed out, by, um, 20, by 2022, the share of 25 to 35-year-olds with a tertiary um, qualification in OECD states is, is around 50%. Indeed, in Ireland, we're up at 68%. On average, across the OECD, 78% of first-time tertiary graduates completed a BA degree, but only 18% completed a short cycle. And in the EU, the data shows that only 9% of tertiary graduates um, completed a short cycle qualification. Over the next decades, participation will rise, particularly at a, uh, as a slower rate in developed countries, but the global south, again, as Alison has pointed out, is expected to rise. And this is reflected in the growing number of universities from about 12,000 in 1997 to over 20,000 officially um, accredited or recognized according to the IAU today, notably there's no such comprehensive information about the rest of the post-secondary system. 
In advanced economies, while economic and technological requirements for labor have pushed skill beyond secondary education, the pursuit of status and social advantage has driven demand for degree level qualifications. These developments are leading to an increasingly polarized labor market between highest and lower skilled occupations and hollowing out middle level skills. We tend to focus on the rising demand for higher skills but ignore the fact that almost 45% of jobs will require mid-level skills, those which require some post-secondary education and training, but less than a four-year college degree. This is having visible consequences for equity, social cohesion, and political participation. As post-secondary education has expanded and evolved, it's diversified. Learners now include people previously unable to access due to socioeconomic circumstances, age, gender, race, ethnicity, citizenship, as well as combining work and family responsibilities. In response, many new types of institutions, different missions, programs, and modes of study have emerged to meet this demand. There has been a reluctance to consider further our adult education, continuing education, or even lifelong learning as part of the tertiary system. Even the term lifelong learning ignores the fact that all learners are lifelong learners. Over time, boundaries have, merged, have blurred between um, vocational, um, professional, and academic. The emphasis on learning outcomes and employability have meant traditional universities and polytechnics now offer similar programs. Indeed, professional and vocational education now constitute a significant proportion of all programs in universities. While mounting professionalization of many other fields has created a credential domino um, effect throughout the wider post-secondary system. Having said this, I think it's important to acknowledge that education and training, which aims to equip learners with knowledge, know-how, and skills and our competences required for particular occupations, or more broadly in the labor market, is an approach to teaching, not something we should relegate or designate to particular institutions only. Higher education is generally, using ISCID, is generally delineated um, by easily recognized qualifications, the bachelor, the master's, and the doctorate. Whereas provision of an attitudes to the non-university sector very considerably. The nomenclature itself illustrates the extent to which academic, academic discourse, I want to emphasize that, and public discourse and policy has framed these institutions and their students as the other, the othering of other institutions. Different types of credentials and descriptors, often with little recognition outside their country, make it hard to track and compare. As higher education participation has risen, TVET has declined, seen only as an alternative access to higher ed or as a provider of last resort. Courses are limited in nature and are perceived as a dead end. Even in Germany, which has a historically strong vocational sector, societal preference for higher levels of education is surging. Allegations of boundary crossing or mission creep usually made by research universities about everyone else and not the other way around, accelerate system tensions. As demographics play havoc with university enrollment, predator behavior and cannibalization of courses egged on by funding systems is common. Even learning pathways and an important widening access strategy is often dominated by higher education. And I refer specifically to universities when I use that term. Higher technical and vocational education has been given a lower priority in education and training in favor of expanding universities and in many countries in pursuit of high level of rankings. And you all know what I think about them. However, as Carnavali has argued, while a BA is indisputably valuable, it's not the only avenue to remunerative and fulfilling work. Expanding opportunities in career and technical education and certain blue collar and STEM occupation can also help people achieve financial security and personal success. 
The debate around skills and skills mismatch is too readily dismissed. It's true that the link between qualifications and occupations is complex and multifaceted. It's true also that skills and employment are not the only indicators of success. Economic growth, well-being, and active citizenship reinforce each other. But there are genuine issues um, affecting um, our societies and so on. The growing list of critical skills on it. I was amazed looking at the Irish list of critical skills shortages. There's a, there is a information coming out of PIAC showing poor adult skills in numeracy and literacy and particularly digital skills. Huge concerns. Evidence of employers bypassing academic credentials or, or developing their own with implications for quality assurance systems. Regionalism and regional disparities are another key area of concern. The UN estimates 68% of the world's population will live in urban areas by 2050, around which social, cultural, and economic life concentrates disproportionately. As this happens, gaps in opportunities and socioeconomic divisions widen. While there are few countries that don't have some form of regional policy, think of leveling up here to some extent, it's rarely coherent across government portfolios or integrated with the educational system or indeed vice versa. Demographic changes pose another serious challenge. In many OECD countries, the traditional post-secondary age cohort is declining as older people grow as a percentage of the population. They require upskilling, reskilling, or repurposing qualifications in response to changes in the labor market or personal circumstances. But higher education has been extremely slow to adapt and the, t and the TVET or FET sector has usually more open to mature learners, have not readily developed in ways in which people can meet and build upon their credentials. Meeting the needs of a more diverse labor, learner population requires changes in the way post-secondary education is designed, delivered, assessed, and funded. This in includes innovative and accessible programs, a shift away from standardized semesters, reduced time from pro program ideation to re delivery, stackable and, transfer and transferable credit accumulation, uh, credentials based on knowledge and skills gained rather than time served, earn and learn dual study models, and so on. There's an increased emphasis also on learner and career pathways to facilitate coherent transitions between and within different institutions and onwards to a chosen career. These developments suggest that it may no longer matter where learning takes place. The creation of regional uh, research and innovation ecosystems forms a key part of place-based and place-responsive smart specialization strategies. By putting so much focus, however, on research universities and startups, we miss the key point. It's people, our graduates, who catalyze knowledge, contribute to the shared pool of ideas through society, and drive and lead innovation, not the institutions. This lacuna has skewed our understanding and appreciate of the rest of the post-secondary sector, um, whose graduates have the capacity to support innovation by raising the overall productive and absorptive capacity levels in high-tech as well as low-tech sectors. They can play a huge role creating intrapreneurs as well as entrepreneurs because product and social innovation can be equally if not more powerful than technological innovation. And it's vital for reskilling and upskilling former industrial areas. Indeed, it will be impossible to close a regional disparity gap if we fail to understand that people are stickier than knowledge. Models for financing our systems vary considerably, but they principally focus on full-time undergraduate learners and, and universities. Spending per learner is highest at the tertiary level and higher again for those universities which undertake research. In contrast, funding for mature learners, lifelong learning opportunities, quality of facilities and supports, the capital structure, the infrastructure, and so on, is limited and doesn't take account of the challenges experienced by diverse learners. This imbalance fuels public perceptions as to which educational opportunities are more favored. Take a think and look at your college, your university campuses and see these wonderful buildings 
then look at the FET colleges and look at their resources and where, how they're maintained and so on. The idea that we can develop, more importantly for me, is the idea that we can develop a funding system separately from a coherent vision and strategy is nonsense. And that's what's happening. The fees lobby, the concern about undergraduate fees trumps everything else. Governance arrangements also differ. The California Master Plan and traditional binary arrangement appear to be settled arrangements, but they have proven to be inflexible and unresponsive to societal and economic changes. At the same time, there's a realization that quality outcomes for the tertiary system depend on the educational system as a whole. Creating a separate further and educa higher education ministry or one that includes research such as we have in Ireland is a great idea as long as it doesn't sever the post-secondary system from the rest of the educational system. Research shows us time and again that by the time children enter school, their levels of cognitive, socioeconomic, emotional, and physical development are already vastly unequal, reproduced through the system itself and through the higher education. So why tertiary? These developments are forcing policymakers and all of us concerned with it. The issue in, in the Irish case, I'll speak only briefly about it, but I'm advising the government on it, is to focus on long-standing weaknesses in the education and training system and the way in which post-secondary education is being delivered and funded. Assumptions that massification would on its own provide opportunities for everyone with mechanisms for social inclusion and mobility are heavily questioned. And entry routes are now seen as just as likely to close off educational and career opportunities as to open them. Getting the balance right can be tricky, not least because existing boundaries and biases are blocking innovative thinking. So what is tertiary? Tertiary education is a wide-ranging term used to describe the educational landscape post-secondary schooling, what the Bologna framework refers to as third cycle. The OECD noted that the term was higher education, but it's clear now that, that the system, that the growing diversity of institutions and programs requires the use of the term tertiary. Due to different regulations around the world, some, such as um, Wales, refers to post-compulsory. ISCA defines tertiary as encompassing everything from short cycle five to the equivalent of level eight. Context depending, this can include everything from technical and vocational education and training, polytechnics, university colleges and universities, but also adult and community education, foundation literacy and numeracy, second chance education, skills development, and continuing education and lifelong learning. It's a huge agenda. So what are we trying to achieve? For me, this is always the key question before we start with all these individual different initiatives. So I refer to the conversation between the Cheshire um, Cat and Alice where Alice asks, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the Cheshire cat says, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. So New Zealand was one, if not the first country, to engage with the issue of tertiary. And their reports began to be published starting um, in 2000. And remain for me some of the most thoughtful and comprehensive pieces of work on the issue. And as an exemplar of policy making, they even conducted a review and have made changes. Um, not everything goes right, but they move, they're moving ahead. Notably, the OECD only entered the tertiary for um, area in 2008. But their conclusions from their first report, and I mentioned just the first three, are as pertinent today as when they were written in 2000. First, a broad definition of the knowledge society should be adopted in the development of policy for tertiary education. This includes recognition of the potentially valuable contribution of all forms of knowledge. Second, the tertiary education system should be broadly defined to encompass all formal and non-formal learning outside the school system. 
And third, the needs of learners should be recognized as central to the, to the design of the tertiary education system. The 2016 Welsh report now being implemented proposed a framework towards 2030. We're almost there. Um, with guiding principles shaping the direction of travel. So a system view, building a coherent educational ecosystem for Wales, meeting the needs of Welsh society now and into the future, learning for life based upon demographics, people being, and the fact that democratic societies require active, engaged, and responsible citizens. Societal contribution, so education contributing through its graduates, new knowledge and innovation, competition and diversity, strong, competitive, diverse institutions working collaboratively and responsibly, learner-focused, placing the needs of learners of all ages, gender, and talent throughout their lives, and institutional autonomy. Scotland has been on this journey for quite a while. Varying US states operate a single system combining community colleges, regional and flagship um, university, although I'm not clear that they actually have any underlying philosophy rather than just cost and status. Australia is currently reviewing its system, and so is Portugal and the Netherlands. In 2022, the Irish government announced the decision to create a unified tertiary system for um, learning skills and knowledge, in which irrespective of where learners enter the further or higher education system or institutions or their research career, they should be in a single system which responds to individual talents, ambitions, and motivations, and responds to middle and high level skill needs. Significantly, it speaks of institutions yeah, of institutions being differentiated according to mission, role, and responsibilities, but working collaboratively to common social, cultural, and economic objectives. So I better speed up. No, okay. When Neil Gaines questions, Alan, if you Okay, okay. Setting out there. objectives is, is the easy part. There's no simple blueprint, and context matters. Our systems have, have evolved over decades in chaotic and confusing ways and there are many types of institutions. Focus is usually on the public sector, but the private sector, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, in my view, are, should be part of the conversation. And graduates are part of our society. All these kinds of issues can also change as there are signs that in the post-COVID world that citizens have far greater expectations of the state and its role and states themselves are more willing to engage directly in actions of strategic importance. The big state is back. Some the elements of a tertiary ecosystem, here are some ideas during the rounds, and I'll be quick on this. First of all, the idea of a single integrated agency for tertiary education, an overarching governance, regulatory, and performance structure and before you think, oh gosh, this won't work, England is particular in the way it operates and the way in which people see things, I have to say. But um, I, yeah, I'll come back to it. A single agency has, a, has benefits. It's a uh, one-stop shop for everyone to be part of the conversation. It can, break, it, can, it can break down silos and link everyone together. Learners should be an obligatory part and obligatory participants in the process. But over-reliance on a unified agency to solve all social and economic ills is naive. The risk of major structural reform, um, that a unified system is no better at alignment between education and societal, economic, and skills than the current system. It can help solve some problems, articulation, inform learners and institutional choices, and promote collaboration but it won't solve the big problems. And many societal challenges are not simply supply side. The big challenge or risk is whether an integrated system would lead to an, a homogenous system with all post-secondary level institutions driving or striving to do the same thing. Would it lead to strong research universities simply cherry picking or cannibalizing the attractive bits of other institutions as they already do? Secondly, a significantly strengthened TVET sector, 
now recognized an, as an essential component, not the whole solution, but a, a key component, facilitates skill development and, and so on. Unfortunately, the geography of access, however, is rarely discussed, and this is one thing that we need to always keep in mind. As the UK Commission on the College of the Future um, recommends, there is an urgent need for a long-term vision for education and training from schools to adults, and what I would say from cradle to grave. Considerable support for building strategic capacity, updating curriculum, investing in human and capital resources, effectively the same attention that's been poured into universities over the past decades must now be applied to the rest of the system. In many countries here, um, such as the UK, further and higher education and apprentices are, are treated as if they were discrete and independent sectors, making it hard for people to access and, in sex and leading to excessive competition, reducing opportunities and quality. We talk often about guided and, and navigable learning pathways, dual study programs, but they run the risk of basically being taken over as just seeing further education as being a pathway to higher education. And there's often too much emphasis on bi bilateral agreements or narrow pathways which simply lead to capturing the learner. But it's clear that if policy remains fixated on traditional college-ready full-time undergraduate students studying on residential campuses, little will change. So thirdly, a national credit accumulation and transfer system, opportunities for people to make choices according to pathways and to move through that system as they can through their life. Where such arrangements exist, they're predominantly voluntary and subject to individual academic and institutional arrangements. It's no longer acceptable. ECTS or similar credit systems um, can help provide the foundation. We also need to look at the more diversified learner population and ensure that we are meeting the wider set of needs that are there and, and a wide range of issues um, to put there. Fourthly, regional and research and innovation ecosystems. Again, a big, a big issue, and I know Mike will talk about that when he launches his book later, but it's again a concept whose time has come. Growing policy focus on the importance of creating and strengthening sustainable regional research and innovation systems Strong cooperation between educational institutions, enterprise, particularly SMEs, and civil society. Place-based, place-responsive, characterized by identifying um, strategic areas based on strengths of regions. However, there's an extremely poor understanding of what this means, especially at power policy level, and how skills can support innovation with respect to, for example, technological process innovation, skills and work organization practices, and innovation in SMEs. Okay. Um, finally, on revamp funding systems. The model is required to seriously reflect these broader um, objectives and change circumstances. Our current system basically um, benefits full-time undergraduate students. Acknowledging that there's an equity and inequity debate, it is endless but we spend too much time tinkering, in my view, with the funding and the fees issue. And it's not clear to me that the lifelong um, loan scheme will bring significant or sufficient change and learner opportunities if the whole system remains effectively the same. I understand also why we have a funding model based on enrollment, but has this unintentionally encouraged predatory behavior by stronger institutions. So a reformed funding model, rebalanced funding model, but certainly reform should, ha should ensure a full alignment with what the unified tertiary education strategy seeks to achieve. The aim should be to bring policy, governance, and funding together in a more coherent way. Ultimately, the funding model drives and begets the system. Fundamentally, before we do anything, we need a whole of tertiary vision and I don't see that here. We, rather than the idea of cherry-picking different initiatives, the post-secondary agenda is huge, 
and has been ignored for far too long. As I mentioned, it encompasses a full range of what we accept as technical vocational training, polytechnics, university colleges and universities, but it also includes its other range of adult and community education, continuing education, foundation literacy and numeracy, second chance, skills development, lifelong learning and so on. It also embraces the R&I agenda. So what is the appropriate mix of educational opportunities and providers that we require and how do we deliver them in an integrated, effective and coherent way? Policy matters. So finally, just to conclude, I wanted to set out some of these ideas about where the conversation is going beyond looking at funding. And I also want to take the, the way of looking at it in the way in which there is no time, in my view, to be complacent to look at these kinds of issues. That our societies, we need to issue a call to arms to our education and training systems at all level, but also to those who make policy, <clears throat> plan, and invest. Collaboration across educational boundaries is also vital. That is, people talking to each other and undertaking the research, not the universities take under doing the research about everyone else and informing in innovative thinking. At the post-secondary level, a unified, well-governed, well-financed tertiary education system offers the best way forward, breaking down the barriers and moving onward for recognizing everyone's talents, moti ambitions, motivations, and life circumstances. So I started off asking, is it time to rethink our model of post-education post-secondary education, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So um, I, I'm going to take two to three questions at a time, if that's okay. Coming first to Simon. Could you say who you are when you ask a question and where you're from? I'm just going to get myself a pencil. If you do two to three at a time, does my memory... Um, well, thank you both, and uh, I do think that uh, they were quite compatible, um, those, those papers, and um, although they talked about different things, uh, primarily they, uh, they actually fit together quite neatly. Um, but education policy and provision are always changing, um, and, and non-university non, non tertiary is very much on the agenda in a lot of places, but we can also get stuck for long periods um, around problems which I'd call cultural, meaning, you know, what people think and what people believe and what they do. Um, I mean, it's astonishing to the degree to which the, the fees debate hijacked the last three major national reports from Deering onwards. The fees debate really drove the report in many ways. Um, the, um, I, w I want to ask each, each speaker one question. Um, and I think there are, it's about cultural change, I think, in this area. Alison, um, you made one comment, which I th in passing almost, which I thought was very important. When you said it was difficult to build social support for non-degree roots if, the, if it wasn't there prior to the period of expansion. And I think that's absolutely right, historically. I mean, the UK is not Netherlands, it's not Germany, it's not Taiwan. It doesn't have those different traditions. You can't just invent them. Um, and, you know, further education, the non-university routes are underfunded, under-respected, under-aspired under to. 97, 98 percent of parents want their kids to go to university. It's a consistent finding in the survey. So how do we, that's a major sh cultural shift we need, isn't it? I mean, it's a social shift more, more than a political shift, because the political space is committed to the tertiary idea, I think, mm -hmm. but underneath that, no. So how do we get that shift? Ellen. Um, the idea of an ecosystem is really appealing, I think. <laughs> uh, it fits with, that, with the times and, um, you know, the notion of interdependence and interaction of the parts is very appealing. Um, but um, there are blockages, aren't there? And, 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 and that's, that's my question, really, about one of those blockages. Short cycle training and 
degree level or extended qualifications, their relationship is, is, a, is the issue, I think, in a lot of ways. Because micro-credentials are very much on the policy agenda in a lot of places. A lot of discussion of that going on. But some of the advocates of micro-credentials are arguing for micro-credentials against degree level or extended qualification. I mean, our, our friend Dirk van Dam recently made a, a, a quite a trenchant statement about the, uh, the obsolescence of universities and, and in, in, in proposing a micro uh, credentials agenda. I mean, OECD Education Skills is talking that way. It's become a kind of either or or zero sum issue. That is not helpful in my view. Um, how do we create a positive sum conversation about short cycle training and micro credentials that doesn't involve us talking down university degrees? Is, is this working or do I need to use another one? It's okay? It's okay. It's okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I stand by that, Simon. I think it's extremely difficult to, to, to change historical systems and the relative status and acceptance and familiarity with them. It's as much that as anything else. Um, <clears throat> introducing something that's brand new is something which is tremendously seductive to people sitting in um, a Ministry of Education or indeed a university. But, you know, it then goes out into a world in which people have 9,999 other things to think about. And if it's non-familiar, then there is this, well, I don't know about that, I only have one life and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> in this country, I, I think that actually there, there, was, there, is, there has genuinely been a policy commitment by governments. This is, in a sense, what's so, what's so interesting, and, and I'll stick with England for, for a moment, because um, there has been a genuine policy commitment which nonetheless ultimately falters at the point when the funding decisions are being made. Um, and it falters partly because there isn't this groundswell of support. It's, I think there are two things that I've concluded. The first is that I, I actually think apprenticeship is not dead in this country. It still has tremendous historic respect. Uh, so I think we could still go that route. I think we, we very nearly killed it off and didn't quite, and now are trying to kill it off again in a completely different way. Um, but it's why over the last few years I have come to feel that Basically, what we need to do is to build on the reputation that apprenticeship still maintains and anchor it much more clearly actually in the college system than it currently is. And the other thing which I think is, is interesting is that we keep saying we've got to do more training, people's jobs are never going to be the same, we all work to a 75, and yet the reality is that everywhere in the world the vast bulk of what goes on is between 18 and 24 in tertiary. I mean, that's not, again, not just. So I think the, the other thing that, that genuinely we may find there's a demand for and we need to make sure that that demand can be met is genuinely people coming back for what's effectively short cycle later in life. And at the moment, it isn't easy to do that. I hope we're going to make it easier. Well, we are making it easier in this country. Whether the supply will then meet it is another question. But um, I think those two things are, the, are the, the way in which you could actually build status support and widespread recognition from something that isn't just the 18, the, 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 B8, the, the, the bachelors at age 18. Just on the issue of culture, very hard to change, but I think there are, it needs a much more integrated whole of government approach and a whole of, and as I said, all you have to do is look at the facilities and then you think, why would I go there? You know, all you have to do is look at the quality. Um, on the issue you asked, I am, I want to say, I don't think um, my book credentials are just to erase any doubt. They're not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a credit transfer system. I think not, <laughs> micro credentials ultimately depend on a body of knowledge, whether it's carpentry, electricity, um, electrics, accountancy, um, business, or whatever. There's a body of knowledge in there. You don't go building a building just knowing how to hammer, which is module one or whatever. So it requires requires that. I think micro credentials are there for um, additionality. Um, particular skills that someone want to, might want to pick up, but it requires that you've got that. Um, so I don't see them as a replacement. 
but there is a wider set of issues about are there other um, educational avenues and can we broaden that conversation out? Um, and how do we do that? And that requires, first of all, that we've got a coherent idea of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that's why I kind of focus on that a lot. We don't, there is no common, well certainly if I looked at England, there isn't, I mean it's not even clear what tertiary means. That's why I spent some time trying to give some definitions to it because it's not clear we're all on the same page. And the reason I also mentioned things about foundation literacy and so on is because that's who's doing it. It's the further education colleges that are taking up that slack that isn't there and it's and because it's mature students, it comes under that, that sector. I come back to the issue of governance. When we look at ecosystems, whether they're regional or we look at a national level, um, governance arrangements, it's not top-down regulatory, you know, everyone, you know, this kind of a way, it's a two-way process. But governance and how you link up supply and demand, how you get those conversations going, and maintained beyond goodwill, a goodwill individual who happens to be at an institution, voluntary activities, um, is a big deal. This requires having an idea and a vision in the first place and carrying it through. One on that table and then one on the back table. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Nick. Yeah. Yeah, you go first, Nick. Uh, Nicholas Barr, London School of Economics. Um, the economic argument for a cost share between taxpayer, the individual beneficiary, and possibly employers is overwhelming. But, Alison, as you've said, there's a cost disease problem and there's political pressures. That didn't matter when we had a 5% system. It matters like hell with a 50% system. So the economics says there needs to be more taxpayer resources. The politics says no. That sounds like a council of despair. That's not like you or me. Um, is there any way out of this, please? Okay. Um, do you want to take one on the back table there? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diana Laurelard, UCL Knowledge Lab. Um, thanks to you both for mapping out this very complex area. Um, lots of questions, but just one to Alison. Um, and it concerns an issue that you're, you raised right at the end. It's still up there, actually that there's a relatively low rating for the quality of higher education and its value among our students. And at the same time, there is an increasing um, demand for participation. Now, this sounds terrible because this is an awful outcome for all that expenditure and growth in higher education that you outlined. And the second part of it, the increase in participation, because the degree is a useful tool for sorting out graduates, is the worst possible reason for doing that. Nothing in there about the learning needs of, of, of all the students, which uh, Hazel referred to. So it sounds like a recipe for decline and ultimate disaster. So as an advisor to our government, could you uh, suggest how you will help them avoid this? Okay, um, so let me start by the fact that actually way back in the 1990s, I was sort of despairing actually. And um, because at that point it was very hard to get any government outside the United States and a few other places to accept that there was a case for sharing the cost with the student. And we did make that leap. And there is now very, very widespread support, including, interestingly, in Scotland, for the idea that students should, should share the cost of tertiary education with the taxpayer. Um, but I do think there's a real problem, and I think it's a very real problem at the moment, and here's something where I cannot talk for other countries other than, um, to some extent, the United States and, and this country. I don't know what public opinion is like on this in, in other places. Um, I think the whole, there, there is a, a really worrying degree of hostility to universities in, among the political classes. They see them as not delivering on the promise, as hugely expensive. Um, the whole COVID period was a disaster for universities because um, never forget the extent to which politicians run, live by anecdote just like the rest of us. You know, of course they get the data, but their cousin's daughter only had this. Or my 
my son spent, was spending vast amounts of money paying his rent and getting no contact. And, and, it, and it added to it. So, so I, I actually am quite depressed about the future, um, not least because the, 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 the in a way that the, the global trade has, has, has eased the has eased it, you know, at the moment in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, in the UK, the, the contribution of global students means that politicians can go on kicking it down the road. Um, and of course they want to keep kicking it down the road because there's always something else they need to spend money on. Right now it's the NHS and again this is not just this country. Every country in Europe has got a medical emergency. Um, so it's not a council of despair. But I do think there are going to be some really hard choices. And the, the thing that actually worries me most is ensuring that governments understand that they have to pick up the tab for the non-elite, non-research part of the tertiary system. That they cannot simply rely on fees, people... Pe you know, companies paying, all the rest of it. That's the bit that I, that I really worry about most, and it's actually incredibly important, not just for, you know, we talk about it being for, for, for life chances, but the reason it's important for life chances is that it's important for, it, it leads to important aspects of the economy. And so there we are in this sort of vicious circle, that the more, the lower productivity growth is, the less money there is. So it's, I'm not in total despair, but I am really concerned, and I do feel that what is needed is a national debate about the fact that you actually have got to spend some money and when there's enough of when pe and, but but it is a fight I mean people screamed like crazy in this country about child care they got child care um, I think we need to scream like crazy about um, funding for tertiary yeah hi I mean it it is an interesting I broadly would say society can't afford the level and the amount of higher education that, that uh, parts of society would want. Um, I would go on to say that, uh, slightly contrary, um, I agree with all what Alison has said, but contrary, I think the more you focus on money, which I think was also the problem with the sector during the Brexit talks, which is gimme, 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 the more the politicians turn off. It's an elite group talking, um, to itself, and I think that's a bad strategy myself. Um, children, uh, primary schools will always, and now we're talking about preschool and so on in, in most countries, will always capture po um, political attention because the schools are in every, you know, on every block or around the corner, and everyone, I mean, they're very direct, um, and schools always get attention. The, the worry is, as, as one would say, as Alison said, the other part of the post-secondary system, which has been hugely deprived of funding, um, partially because most of the politicians weren't there themselves. Um, they don't know it. They don't really, they turn their back. Well, now, you know, you, you better pay attention to it. You've got these social political problems on your doorstep. And um, this is really... Uh, that kind of battle that we see ideologically fighting itself out, not just in the U.S., but also here and indeed in, in other countries as well. Um, I do think the funding model drives particularly predatory behavior. Um, and so just looking at the funding model as the way forward, I, I just would really open up that conversation, a public discourse, a citizens' assembly, what is the post-secondary system? What do you want from it? And then how do we work our way backwards and work out how to fund it? But just cherry-picking ideas out there, I think, is a job to, to um, nowhere. Uh, Peter Scott from, uh, from here, um, occasionally. Um, this is a comment rather than a question, but I'll be interested to hear both of you. Sorry, Ellen, I can now see you behind the podium. Um, I think the question is, what is the kind of essential message that's being sent when we say well, we want to go tertiary? Simon said that this has now become a kind of universal assumption that we're going to go tertiary. But what does that mean? It seems to me there are kind of a couple of 
actually quite contrasting ideas. One is to see going tertiary rather as we thought 60, 50, 60 years ago, what going higher education meant. In other words, embracing and expanding the idea of higher education so it's no longer just about universities. And that was really a very emancipatory, very democratizing idea um, because it shifted resources into different kinds of institutions. Um, um, that's one idea. And I think a lot of people assume that when we say going tertiary, that's what it is. The next stage, we're going to be, you know, it's like that, like that, that, that. But there's another alternative idea, and that's a kind of slightly more conservative idea of what's going on here. And that is putting the university back in their box, particularly these kind of non-elite universities who've got ideas above their station um, and are absorbing resources and taking them away from colleges where I'm not sure that's true, but these are the kind of assumptions that are being made. So it's about putting people back in the box. So it's a sort of almost an anti-mass higher education movement. Um, and another message being sent, I think, is that um, by thinking tertiary in these very broad terms, very comprehensive terms, we can allow elite universities, which are really what matter, to kind of forge ahead. And that's really what it's about, really. Um, and a third sort of conservative message that might be getting sent is that, well, this is actually really emphasizes fundamentally that post-school education is basically about relating to the employment market, about employability. That's its main function, its dominant function. Um, and now, in a way, I think we have to decide what kind of message is being sent here before we get into the detail of funding, governance, credentials, all these kind of things, really. Um, so I'd just be interested to hear. And I do apologize to Alison because I came too late and missed your talk. <laughs> And just take one more, Dave, you might stand up because of the lectern. Thanks, David Sweeney, University of Birmingham. I throw away a comment, perhaps, is, uh, first of all, is setting a hurdle of you need an integrated, joined-up government too high a hurdle to ever be achieved in the current democratic uh, situation? And, but uh, more particularly, uh, the third way out is indeed more, more funding from employers, taking account of the fact they are, are the beneficiaries. We have persistently failed at that in, in the UK over the last 20 years, partly because the expressed preference of employers uh, for vocational skills is not matched by the revealed preference to hire people from Oxbridge uh, and the like. Uh, but secondly, because uh, all employers are looking for public subsidies, how do we alter the system to provide incentives for employers, whether it be through the apprenticeship route or through other routes, uh, to contribute to the total cost of tertiary education. Okay, can I take them in reverse? Because you know, I think these are, are, are really important questions, and they're ones which I think it's, it's quite interesting. People haven't given as much thought to as you would hope. Um, while I was still working as an advisor, we, the, the Treasury actually asked for a sort of a big background paper on incentives for employers, and everybody, you know, people went away and dutifully trawled through all the, the, the research literature and the evaluations from other countries and so on. And what actually became obvious was that there, there, there wasn't a really good, strong body of discussion for this. And, and of course, you know, coming back to, to where Simon started, in countries where you've got a very well-established apprenticeship route, though even there it tends to be under threat, by the way, I'll come back to that. Um, the, it's, this, is, this is something that, that, that we don't seem to have a huge amount of good practice elsewhere that we could pull on, so maybe we have to, we have to do it. Because I, I do think, and this actually goes back to what everybody was saying earlier in terms of how do you get out of what I feel is, a, a, in many cases, a, a not, a good, not a good highway to go on. Um, it has to involve employers. I mean, it has to involve employers in a, in a more coherent way than it has at the moment, and not just in terms of, not just in terms of apprenticeships either. Um, so I think that, that um, and this is, I suppose, where I do disagree with Anna. I mean, I actually think that waiting for a coherent, joined-up um, policy right across government that actually gets rolled out, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. Um, and that actually comes back to my first point, which is that I actually think that, in a way, that, that slide that I've left up slightly encapsulates the problem, because many of the people who think that college is not good value nonetheless feel they should go, their children should go. And I just, and, and I think it's very hard to reverse this. And just as a sort of a, a, a sort of a, 
comparison point in terms of how you can end up with a system which maybe nobody quite wanted. Um, there's this idea that in this country grammar schools were abolished by progressive Labour politicians. Actually they were abolished by middle class parents who couldn't get their children into them. And I think we should probably bear that in mind when we're thinking about the, the, the challenges of creating a tertiary system which is more fit for purpose than the current one. Ellen. Yeah. Um, well, whether you, have, you can get everyone joined up on government, I think there's a lot of lessons from Wales. They stuck to it, and they've come out the other end. Um, the unfortunate bit about the English bit of the system is that it's ideologically driven. It's not the only one. And so you get one group in and the next group in and so on. I think, you, yeah, you can't wait and get the whole government in, but unless you have some idea about what it is to answer Peter's question of what exactly does go in tertiary mean, then every world will take you there. And I think essentially systems have evolved and those we've got a survival of the fittest, which is largely uh, what the kind of systems that we do have. Um, it is about opening up the system, but how I think it is all these um, mechanics. How? What does that mean? I think, Peter, all those ideas are really out there to, to think about and to model. There's no blueprint. No, one, no country has said, well, they've got it and we'll copy this. Um, on the issue about employers, um, Ireland operates a national training fund to which all employers um, pay into. Um, there's actually a surplus in it at the moment, but um, a huge surplus. Um, but it's not the only way. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Employers need to need to pay. I also agree it is a joined up, um, sharing operation. Um, apprenticeships operate in a much wider sphere. Again, in the Irish case, they're piloting a wide range of apprenticeships that are across all kinds of uh, fields, um, not your traditional just the building technician um, uh, fields that that used to be um, was there or automobile automobile engineering and so on, but a wide range, range of fields. And arguably, the, the whole issue of changes in the way learning takes place between, that's what I said, the issue of vocational um, and what we might call uh, practice-based learning is across all disciplines. It's not just for some, and it's increasingly, it's an approach to teaching and learning it's not necessarily just an institutional type. Thanks very much, uh, Tristan McCowan, UCL. Uh, thanks for the really stimulating talks. I was struck by your point, Alison, that um, uh, many of the traditional prof professions actually started out with something like an apprenticeship model. And it made me think about that uh, graph of, of extraordinary growth and how we interpret this. And, um, of course, you know, higher education, tertiary education sectors and universities specifically have have embraced the gradual incorporation of more and more types of profession and, and, and other uh, forms of work uh, into their ranks, increasing revenue and prominence in society and so forth, but also creating uh, a number of strains in terms of expectations of creating work-ready graduates and employability and so forth. And my question is, um, when we look at this graph of, of, of unending growth, extraordinary growth, is it, we assume that this is a net gain in learning for society. Um, should we reinterpret that to think of it more as a recategorization? Uh, is, is this just a transferring of learning that was actually taking place in workplaces and in society and perhaps in other forms of institution at secondary level sometimes or specialist institutions that's now just being rebranded as, as, as uh, university or tertiary education? Um. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, in terms of what follows, it's actually a very interesting question because um, you, we might also ask ourselves, I mean, is this, is this sensible? I mean, is it act does one actually learn it better in a university? And sometimes the answer is no, but of course, again, from the point of view of the employer, if you're going to be able to hire a graduate who's done a very large part of the training that you used to have to run without you having to have anything to do with it, I mean, why, why would you not be perfectly happy with it? So I think it's a, it's a very real question. And um, it, 
it also sort of underlines the fact that, that you know, because so much that used not to be in a university is now in a university and is in higher education, it, it therefore, it, again, it just becomes the kind of the, the natural thing to do, that, that you, you go on to further formal study rather than going into articles in, in a workplace. And, and again, kind of, how do you, should you go back from there? Should we see this as something that we are unhappy about? And, and, and how do we? Um, and it, it's interesting. I mean, in this country, there is this um, attempt to create degree apprenticeships, which are kind of awkward and are soaking up a vast amount of the, of, of the, of the money that's there for apprenticeships. That's a whole other conversation, not for, the, not for this time. Um, and the funny thing is, I don't think in discussing these, there was ever any really coherent thought within government about, you know, were we right to, you know, accountancy is the only one that hasn't become an all graduate profession pretty much in, this, in, in the UK. You can still do that by part-time study from the workplace. But, you know, was it a good idea for, for this to happen? Or do we actually want to rethink it? It wasn't like that at all. It was literally politicians going, well, if we want to raise the status of apprenticeships, we should have degree apprenticeships, because then everybody will know that apprenticeships are a good thing. And I don't feel we've begun to think this one through. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, is the answer to your, to your point. I absolutely totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that about accountancy. Um, yeah, I mean, most courses in the universities are effectively um, vocational education and training. We just call them professional. I mean, in fact, the overwhelming number of them in the universities, whether it's education, where we're sitting now, or it's or the health professions, or it's business, which is the largest faculty in, in many, they're all, they're all in that um, domain, even in de talking about computing. Um, so um, it, it's just, um, again, their social status, the way in their terminology we use about it. There is a growing um, focus on dual study programs, on work-based learning, of students doing um, community-based learning, all kinds of different initiatives around moving away from the traditional chalk and talk, which clearly has gone out. But, you know, that whole kind of change, there are a huge number of different models many of the, quote, newer universities are much more vested in them than the older ones. But um, these, these different models, I think, are coming. There are differences about the apprenticeship. I agree that we need to probably think that through. But there is also a whole wide range of other kinds of educational opportunities. And we need to look at how, how we um, think through the issue, unless we have a wider conversation than just in government ministries about coming up with new schemes, it, nothing will catch on. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that's it. I, I think everybody remembers your phrase about waiting for coherent policy. I won't hurt my breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, that, that's it. Let me give our speakers a round of applause.